Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to today's episode of Off the Record. This week on the show, the upcoming election. Sport Weekly Talk Eurovision. And Battle Arena Melbourne. I'm Ashley. And I'm Sophie. It's good to see you guys again. Now, remember, you can follow us on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Off the Record LT. And if you want to catch up on previous shows, you can do it on our Upstart Magazine Facebook page or YouTube channel. So, Sophie, this week, pretty flat out. Oh, yes, I'm so tired. It's sort of that very last stretch towards the end of semester one and sort of everything is due around this time. So it's like I'm I'm almost having trouble keeping up with everything. I'm yeah. paranoid that I'll forget something and then the due date will roll past and I'm like, oh, I was supposed to do that. I write a checklist. Like I write a checklist that needs to be completed every single week mm -hmm. and I make sure I go back to it and that's how I stay on top of it all. Okay. Yeah, being flat out with our documentary being filmed this weekend, We've been pretty on top of it, finishing all of our assignments for other subjects like two weeks in advance. That is taking up a lot of your time, that doco. It is, but it's lots of fun. It's what I'm passionate about. Now, As long as you enjoy it. Yeah, it's pretty great. So what's happening in the news today? Making news this week. The Labor Party have accused Sydney Liberal volunteers of using racially charged language at a polling booth. Reed electorate candidate Sam Crosby claims that Liberal volunteers allegedly scolded Labor volunteers for speaking Mandarin and Cantonese. Crosby says the incident has occurred twice in the last week and has lodged a complaint to electoral officials in the pre-polling station. Drivers are searching f divers, excuse me, are searching for two missing people after a fatal seaplane collision in Alaska. The dive teams believe the missing passengers, one Australian and one Canadian, may still be in the water. The collision occurred after two sightseeing seaplanes collided mid-air. The Coast Guard have confirmed four fatalities and ten injuries. American authorities have also confirmed an investigation of the accident will take place. An Australian Uber Eats drivers and riders have protested yesterday at the company headquarters headquarters in Port Melbourne. The protesters claim they are owed millions of dollars in unpaid wages including and other entitlements including sick leave, annual leave and missing superannuation payments. The Transport Workers Union have supported the protests citing a survey from last year showing that three out of four riders are paid below minimum wage rates. And yesterday, New Zealand announced a world first wellbeing budget focusing on poverty, domestic violence and mental health. Finance Minister Grant Robertson said that despite New Zealand's growing economy, many citizens are being left behind. He said that home ownership was at its lowest in 60 years and that suicide rates, homelessness and food aid grants were increasing. The New Zealand Labor Party hopes to decrease these rates in the near future. The budget will be handed down on the 30th of May. Wow, a lot of stuff making news this week. Yeah. It's all mainly election focused, but hearts go out to the two people still missing. Yeah, uh, I, that's probably my biggest fear. I like I'm, I like being in close. I like close spaces. Being left in the ocean, Ooh. biggest fear. Biggest yeah. fear. It's really, it's really not exactly something you'd expect to happen especially as a tourist and I, I like flying I love being in planes but like that's always kind of at the back of your mind yeah no thank you no thank you mm. um I'm a little bit disgusted about the race racist comments yeah, that are made it's horrible yeah I grew up thinking that we were going to be the first generation to be completely non-prejudiced yeah and over like the past five years I quickly realized that it were well, almost the exact opposite yeah. Like, I understand there's a lot of change that needs to happen and there's going to be a lot of extremes. and But I think that's opening to, like, the radical extremists who really put a bad word on our generation. Yeah, and you think we'd sort of, like, pick up the hint and change. Hmm, like, I feel like we're setting up for the next generation. Mm. Um, I just hope that we do it right without being rude. And yeah, I just don't think there's any space for being prejudiced. And what do you think of being, of the drivers and riders being paid less than minimum wage? Uh, it's a hard topic. Um, I mean, nobody wants to get paid less than minimum wage, but like there's pros and cons to it. You have the advantage of having more of like an open way of earning money. The second you start putting all these like, um, these things in that is going to make, make it significantly more difficult for some drivers. Um, I mean, but when you open, when you go into a market like this and you kind of have to abide by the laws of the country that you open the market in. Well, I think in my opinion, and unfortunately, it's kind of a, a risk 
in the hospitality industry or things to do with food. Um, I'd been somebody who, as someone who's worked in a cafe myself, I've um, seen all of the articles about people being paid 12, 10, $8 an hour. Like it's ridiculous. And they seem to especially, um, people more targeted by being underpaid are often overseas overseas students, people who've come here from other countries. It's very true. Mm. Now guys, the election is coming coming up this Saturday. Are mm. you excited? Have you voted? Nope, and I'm not really sure where to go with that. Well, <laughs> I hope you have a little bit more of an idea because Sophie has more to tell us. On Saturday the 18th of May, Australia will head to the polls to vote in the federal election. We headed to the Agora to get some opinions on who the La Trobe community thinks will be running the country by this time next week. Climate change has been the hot topic for this year's election, alongside education, jobs and the Banking Royal Commission. Um, I'd say one of the big ones would be climate change. So we're living in a world at the moment where, like, we're in a climate emergency. I think climate change is a big issue, like um, renewables and um, coal-fired plants are becoming a big thing. The major parties have been heavily advertising their policies, with Clive Palmer and the United Australia Party lighting up screens in bright yellow. Um, I think it's quite interesting that we have people like Clive Palmer that are spending millions of dollars on trying to get into Parliament, um, but have no real effective policy uh, that they've that he's spending $70 million on advertising but still owes the government $70 million for bailing out Queensland Nickel. I think that you can't buy your way into Parliament, that you need to actually have effective policy within the electorate. Some Australians have already voted in early voting centres. Um, well, as a matter of fact, I've voted early. I okay. voted on the first day of pre-poll. Ray Fordham is a politics major at La Trobe. Uh, as for this upcoming election, I think first of all the competence of the government. The government has been utterly divided and uh, they cannot hold on to their own, they, they cannot hold on to a leader for more than like a single term. It's a malaise that is uh, set in. It's been happening since like the uh, Rudd Gillard era, but like it's um, definitely exacerbated. It's worsened under um, the current administration. Um, but besides um, the issue of competence and leadership, I think uh, one of the main issues of uh, this election is climate change and the lack of action by the current government in addressing it. Ray believes the Australian Labor Party will take out the most seats this year. My prediction, my gut feeling is that like in Victoria um, there will be a substantial swing towards the ALP, um, not only in like um, t key marginal seats but also in seats formerly considered blue, li blue ribbon liberal heartland seats like Kuyong or Higgins or Flinders uh, because in the past like Victoria was considered a jewel in the liberal crown but uh, in recent times, um, Victorian, Victorians, like the Victorian liberals are generally more progressive than their counterparts um, in other parts of Australia. They're more moderate, they're small L liberal, um, to put it in one way. And uh, they do not like what they see in like Peter Dutton or even Scott Morrison and like the way like they completely, uh, they, they, in the way they depose of Malcolm Turnbull, who was actually really popular in uh, uh, Victoria. So I reckon in Victoria there will be a substantial, substantial swing uh, to Labor. Eligible citizens have until 6pm on Saturday the 18th of May to vote. I'm Sophie Evans, off the record. There we go. Um, hopefully that provides a little bit more coverage on the, coverage on the election. Also want to point out, I'm sorry, we're having a few more technical issues this week. We've just got things going wrong left and right. No, that's alright. The show's going well. Are, now, we, are, we, are we cursing it? Did you learn much from the people talking about the election? I did learn quite a bit more and it was very interesting to talk to Ray about it. I was really amazed about how much he knew about Australian politics and I'm not usually somebody who I don't really know heaps or sort of show any interest in it but now that I'm at voting age I kind of have to now. Yeah it is a bit important. Uh, something that I'm finding really frustrating about it at the moment about the whole election is what's happening with the Adani mine. Yeah, and having covered the climate strike in the very first episode, I learned so much about that and it's really, climate change is definitely an issue that we, I think they're listening. Yeah, I just don't think it's an issue that you should use as leverage for an election. Like, mm. decisions on the Adani mine should be made after the election happens because, I mean, it is democracy, it is, we all vote. And if people protest? Don't just approve things for the sake of votes. Mm. Yeah. Well, moving over to sport this week, Jack and Cody are joined by Lakshmi to discuss Eurovision.
Hey guys, welcome back to Sport Weekly. I'm Cody Mapson Laura. I'm here with Jack and Lakshmi. And we're here at La Trobe's Menzi Theatre because we're going to be discussing Eurovision, which I know it doesn't seem like a sport, but when you actually think about it, it's a competition where countries from around Europe and now the world compete. Lakshmi here is a self-confessed Eurovision tragic and she's going to explain to both me and Jack what Eurovision is. Yes, it, it's so nice to be here actually and it's really exciting because Eurovision is happening this week. We've, um, If you're a Eurovision tragic like me, this week is like Christmas. You've been waiting for it for the entire year. So Eurovision is an annual song contest held in a different city each year and it's watched by millions over the world, not just in Europe but there's a huge fan base in Australia and that's why we're actually in Eurovision and I've heard talks of um, possibly China as well are going to get in on Eurovision which is exciting. So this year's Eurovision is actually being held in Tel Aviv in Israel because last year's Eurovision winner was Netta with the song Toy and she was representing Israel so the winner of the previous year always gets to host it in their city. There has actually been a little bit of controversy um, regarding how Israel are hosting Eurovision this year because obviously uh, there is a lot of conflict between Israel and Palestine and there has been in the past quite a big movement around boycotting Israel for that same reason um, by musicians. It's supported by some really big names including Lauren Hill, uh, Roger Waters is quite a big advocate of that as well. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes down this year. Who do we have representing Australia this year? So this year, Australia had its first um, ever national selection, which is really exciting. We got uh, a chance to vote on who could represent us this year. And so the winner of that was Kate Miller Heike with the song Zero Gravity, which is a nice little opera kind of pop song uh, about her experiences with postnatal depression. Should be very interesting. Yeah. And what are sort of the more out there acts that we've had over the years? Oh, there's been so many out there acts. Eurovision is notorious for some weird, wacky, glittery, amazing things. Uh, there's been uh, 2012, I believe, was um, when Russia sent a bunch of grandmas to sing Party for Everybody, which was a huge surprise because they started with this nice little kind of traditional song and then exploded into this party pop song and then of course uh, there's the epic sax guy you might know him from YouTube lots of memes out there um, Moldova sent him well in 2006 uh, Finland won Eurovision with Lordi and Hard Rock Hallelujah and so that was an act where they were dressed as sort of Slipknot style um, monster masks and played a heavy metal song oh yeah <laughs> and yeah that was Finland's only win actually mm -hmm. Australia are competing again this year for the fourth year in a row and it's really exciting because Australia competes, Australians get to vote as well. So if you're ready to get up at five o'clock in the morning, you can vote and it's really exciting. Eurovision started this morning and will finish this Saturday. That's it for Sport Weekly. Back to you guys. So much for that guys and now today we're doing something we haven't actually done before we are joined on skype by peter bardi a speech coach with the mcguire program thank you so much for joining us today thank you for having me so um did you have any experience with speech impediments in the past well everyone on the mcguire program has struggled with stuttering so my first memories of speaking were stuttering and it's been a constant thing through my life and the fact that I'm here now speaking with you on a live Skype call is testament. Oh, it's, to an amazing, the, it's an amazing achievement. Yes, and it's amazing being a part of this program and having the opportunity to see the courage that so many people have in facing their fear of stuttering and fear of speaking. It's a crippling condition. And how did you become a speech coach with the Maguire program? Well, I started as a graduate. I attended a first course and then the more you learn, the more you take input from others then you start also sharing your experiences and wanting to impact in the lives of new grads joining as well. So 
there's a certification process to become a coach. And then you get the opportunity to walk beside people joining the program and helping them as they start their journey to become an eloquent speaker. And um, how do you go about coaching people who might have a speech impediment? There's two ways. The first way is really emphasizing the technique, like showing the technique, demonstrating it, helping them to learn what the different aspects of this Maguire technique are. So the breathing, the vocalization or the speaking process, and the just encouraging them to face their fears. So the second part is sharing experiences and helping them to learn from the mistakes I've made and then seeing the benefits of facing fears, of pushing out our comfort zones and doing things that we're not, wouldn't normally do. Mm. Yeah, it's incredible sharing success, spreading it, kind of paying it forward almost. It's, uh, it's an incredible thing you guys are doing and it's, it's impressive that you keep moving forward. Um, now, when it comes to speech impediment stuff like this, do you work with stuff that stuff that do you work with things that people are born with, or do you work with trauma as well? The actual cause of stuttering, it's not defined, so it's not known whether it's genetic, whether it's as a result of some fear, anxiety. But the basic physical cause of stuttering is that we get scared, we have fear, we panic, so we stop breathing. And if you ever try to speak while holding your breath and then try and force out a word, that's basically what stuttering is. That it's stopping breathing because we're panicking but then trying to force words and sounds out with our mouth and our lips and our tongue. So that's the physical part. And then the psychological part is the fear that underpins it. So it's probably a learned response to fear, but not everyone responds to fear by stuttering. Some respond to fear by getting headaches, by just opting out, by getting sweaty. So it's really interesting that there's this common denominator among all people on the Maguire program that their response to fear is freezing. And when they go to speak, they need to relearn how to breathe and relearn the speech mechanics. Yeah, it's kind of amazing when you put it in that sort of perspective um, because I definitely know I have responses to fear and uh, talking, unfortunately, is quite difficult when you're on camera and we know from experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it's incredible that you guys are dealing with it and it's great that like confidence is and sharing that confidence with others and really making sure that people feel comfortable is one of the first steps of helping those sorts of things. So this this... Uh, organization, this program really helps a lot of people. It definitely does. And each person on the program knows how much of a struggle stuttering is. So we've got that immediate empathy with everyone else on the program. And it gives that common bond. So friendships jump up three rungs of the ladder. So it's easy to talk to people because there's this common struggle that we're working to not just overcome, but become better speakers, better communicators as a result of this struggle. So it's not just not stuttering, it's actually becoming a more effective communicator than people who haven't struggled with stuttering. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people really appreciate the guy, the effort that you guys are putting in. A lot of people seem to, it's quite a large 
program across the entire world. So I'm assuming a lot of people are very happy that it exists. And we appreciate it a lot. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. We really, appre uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Anytime, anytime. Now, guys, heading over to the Culture Corner to talk about Battle Arena Melbourne that's happening this weekend. Hey, guys, welcome to the Culture Corner. I'm Matheos. I'm Dorito. Here on the Culture Corner, we cover pop culture news and game reviews. This week, BAM 11 is being held at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. BAM, or Battle Arena Melbourne, is Australia's largest fighting game tournament hosted by Couch Warriors. Battle Arena Melbourne is a three-day event starting on Friday the 17th of May and goes until the 19th of May. Over the 11 years that BAM has been running, it has become quite popular and is now considered the largest open entry esports event in Australia. Being a fighting game tournament, these are some of the games you'll expect to see people competing in. Games like Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Street Fighter V, Tekken 7, Along with those titles, you also have Super Smash Bros. Melee, Dragon Ball Z Fighters, and Soul Calibur VI. There's pretty much fighting games for all genres. Along with a large amount of games being played at the tournament, there's categories for each game as well. Some of the most exciting Super Smash Bros. I watch is Team Play, which I'm really keen for and would probably be something that I'll be signing up for. Being a little bit of an ego person here, I actually prefer the singles format. I like versing one-on-one -on -one battles. Uh, just last year, we had the number one melee player fly down and I versed him in a friendlies match and I actually took two lives off him, so I felt pretty chuffed about myself after that. With its rise in popularity, uh, it's quite a destination for international players as well. Some of the largest names in these games have come to Australia, one, to visit our amazing culture, but two, to destroy us. In the past, we've had big names like Alliance Armada, C9 Mango, TSM Leffen, and even local heroes that we have as Spud, who isn't sponsored, but he's a pretty damn good MAF player in Super Smash Bros. Melee. So it's pretty exciting the amount of names that fly down to this one event in Australia. Legends from other titles like Street Fighter have come to BAM. Takedo, been a legend for as long as I can remember fighting games. Infiltration, which is a five-time evolution champion, has come to Australia. I mean, I played against him, but I don't think I managed to push any buttons. <laughs> but it was an experience in itself. BAM is my favorite event of the year. It's something that I try to attend every single time it comes through. I'm a huge fan of fighting games and I'm a huge part of the fighting game community. So it's really exciting to go. Yeah, I'm pretty excited too. It's the one event each year where we can actually show off our skills and practice that we've had leading up to these these games. Because even if you're into Smash Brothers, Street Fighter, Dragon Ball Z Fighters, there's, there's a game for you so long as you like the fighting game community. Yeah, and often most people have their own small communities that they're a part of. It's really exciting taking those small groups of people and seeing how you compare against the rest of Australia or even other international people. You get to play against the players that you idolize. I'm really looking forward to the friendlies, meeting new people within the community, and playing these games that I absolutely love. That's what BAM 11 is to me. So guys, if you've never been to a fighting game tournament, please come to BAM 11. It's an incredible experience, and we hope to see you guys there. We will be keeping an eye on our Twitter, at OTR Culture, so if you do want to contact us, please do, and we'll try and organize some sort of meetup. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Atheos. And I've been Dorito. I look forward to seeing you next time, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for that, guys. Super exciting. Yeah, I'm super keen to be there. Uh, we're filming a documentary there. Ooh. Yeah, uh, it's my favorite event of the year. Uh, it's what I put most of my spare time into playing those types of video games. Um, so I'm super excited to go. If you guys are going to be there, please let yes, us know. Yes, we'd love to see you there. Yeah, OTR Culture, at OTR Culture. Um, contact us on our Twitter, and we might be able to catch up, actually say hi to some of you guys. Moving on, Lakshmi will be joining us in a sec to discuss what's happening in Melbourne. Welcome back, Lakshmi. Welcome. Hi. Um, so I've been hearing you guys are very tired this week, actually. Tired's an understatement. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there's been so many assignments, exams are approaching as well. There's so much going on. And if you need a little bit of a, a reprieve from all of that, 
It's actually Good Beer Week this week. <laughs> good Beer Week. Good Beer Week. Do explain. Yes. Yeah, so this is happening in various locations around Melbourne um, from the 10th till the 19th of May, which is this Sunday. Mm-hmm. And so Good Beer Week is, funnily enough, in its eighth year. I've never actually heard of it before. but it's been. Yeah. Have it's you a, been? Yeah. Oh, it's cool. an experience. Yeah? Yeah. How was it? It was actually incredible. Like, uh, it, there's kind of a beer for everyone. Okay. Which is really interesting. I, I enjoy that. Not a lot of people love beer. But are you then guys people beer people? For it. Uh, I am. You are? I am. Yeah. You, not so much? Not so much. No, I'm more of a wine person. <laughs> if it's put in front of me, I'll drink it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so this actually, um, funny that you say that there is something for everyone. Uh, so even if you aren't really a beer fan, there is a little bit of... Um, whiskey and uh, I think cider appreciation going on as well. So uh, there's over 300 beer related events across the city, including live music, masterclasses. You can actually see how beer is made. There's tastings, parties, and there's even a beer high tea. (laughs) <laughs> what? <Some> beer and scones. <laughs> beer and scones. Um, there are so many events and on the website they've actually got different categories to make it easy for you to find your events that you want to go to. So there's uh, Foodie, there's Beer Lover, Beer Geek and Good Times as well as Beer School for Education. So the website has these different categories and if you click on them you can see uh, events tailored to that category. Mm. Uh, yeah, so there's something for everyone. Again, 300 events is a lot. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, some of not just Melbourne but Australia's best brewers. So definitely get around it, and as always, drink responsibly. Yeah, don't want to kill too many of those brain cells before exams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and the next event that we have um, going on this week is this Sunday, nineteenth of May, at six o'clock at uh, Cinema Nova Carlton. And so what this is, it's a screening of the David Lynch film Inland Empire. That's being done in collaboration with Cinema Nova as well as Heidi Museum of Modern Art. Now, of course, David Lynch is best known for Twin Peaks and Mulholland Drive. Yeah, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about Inland Empire. You might not have heard of it. It's a bit more of his obscure film. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an experimental thriller that's been shot on digital video. And because of it being shot on digital video, it took over three years to make this film. Yeah, it's a long time to make a film. (laughs) Um, It's a bit like your documentary, actually. It's taking a bit of time, isn't it? I don't want to talk about it. Uh, So this is the synopsis they have on the Heidi website. So um, Hollywood actress Nikki Grace is preparing for her biggest role yet, but when she finds herself falling for her co-star, she realises that her life is beginning to mimic the fictional film that they're shooting. Interesting. That's eerie, isn't it? Ooh. Ooh. And it's actually got a 72% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, so, so it should be people a good like film. it. Not bad, not bad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the screening actually links into an exhibition going on at the Heidi called Temptation to Coexist by Janet Birchill and Jennifer McCamley. And so there'll be a curator there to give you an introduction on how the exhibition takes inspiration from the film. And the ticket actually covers entry into the exhibition. So gift that keeps giving. It sounds Two like for an one. incredible weekend. Yeah. Battle yeah. in Melbourne, Cinema Nova, Good Beer Week. Yeah. Everyone's going to be busy. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us, and best of luck to anybody who's currently dealing with exams at the moment. Yeah, cool. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and see previous episodes on Upstart Magazine, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Sophie Evans. I'm Ashley Dryhurst. <laughs>